<clears throat> so we've been talking about baggage, and it all started with <clears throat> Matthew 11, verse 28 to 30. And I'll start with this passage of scripture that started this series on baggage. It says this, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. <clears throat> so we've been going through and we've been talking about this series on baggage and we've been looking at different things and it, it started off, we introduced it and, and when we introduced it, we ended with this quote that says, <clears throat> I am certain that he will be who he said he will be. I have learned to trust hope, expect in him. It has been far from easy, but as I've grown closer to him, I see less me and more he. And from there, we begin to break down and look at this idea of baggage and look at it from a few different places. And so we start talking about guilt and shame. We talked about guilt and shame a few weeks ago, and, and we, we came to the realization, listen, he has made us free. So live free. <clears throat> Don't live our, your, your life in the past. Don't live, live your life uh, being absorbed by, by, by the things that you've done in the past and, and the mistakes that you've made. But find freedom in Christ that he has forgiven us, that he doesn't condemn us, but he brings us salvation. And then we came last week and we talked about hurt and pain. And we said that hurt and pain should point us to some things. It should point us to our need for God's love and salvation. It should let us know that our journey isn't done, that we still have to grow, we still have room to grow, we still have things to experience, and we talk about that our experiences can help heal others. Amen. Okay, that when we go through what we've been through, as we find release from the baggage we carry, as we find grace and mercy and love, as we recognize and grow in Him, we should be using what we've been through to reach out to others who are struggling as well. And then we talked about it with, with that, that we have a need to forgive ourselves and also a need to forgive others. So we come today and we're talking about baggage today. And we're going to start off with this quote. It says this, where does your security lie? Is God your refuge, your hiding place, your stronghold, your shepherd, your counselor, your friend, your redeemer, your savior, your guide? If he is, you don't need to search any further for security. A powerful quote that, that puts it in front of us of, of who he is and, and, and who he should be in our lives. Psalm 94, 19 says this, when my anxious thoughts multiply within me, your consolations delight my soul. And so we're going to talk about anxiety and fear. And it's interesting because when you look through scripture, you find that they go together often. You find that they're almost interchangeable. Uh, and we battle and we deal with them on, on so many different levels, but we find that they're so similar and, and, and they're really, you know, bedfellows. They come together and they spend time together. And when, when fear pops up, anxiety is usually right there with it. When anxiety pops up, fear is usually right there along beside it. Beside it. And so we're going to look at four points today. We're going to start off again with a story out of Mark chapter 5. Then we're going to talk about the lies and hurt and pain. Sorry, we're going to talk about uh, um, the lies that we deal with, with the anxiety and, and the fear that we deal with. And then we're going to look at the truth. And then we're going to come back and, and look at how this applies to us. How does this impact us? And so in Mark chapter 5, we see an awesome story. In Mark chapter 5, we see this great story. And it connects with, and, and what we talked about last week, flips in between. And so we're going to start and then we're going to skip what we talked about last week and then jump back to the rest of the story. And so let's look at Mark chapter 5. When Jesus had crossed over again in the boat to the other side, a large crowd gathered around him. A large crowd gathered around him. And so he stayed by the seashore. One of the synagogue officials named Jarius came up and on seeing him fell at his feet. And he implored him earnestly saying, my little daughter is at the point of death. Please come and lay your hands on her. So that, uh, so that come, he, this, this, this synagogue official comes, and, he, and he, the power in this is that he's recognizing something about Jesus that's really significant. Because many of the religious leaders looked at Jesus and they saw heretic, they saw blasphemy, they saw somebody who was challenging their authority, challenging their spiritual rule. But what we see from this, this synagogue official in Jairus is we don't see that. He comes to him and he says, listen, come lay your hands on her so that she will get well and live. And he went off with him, and a large crowd was following him and pressing in on him. And now we skip a little bit because what happens in these next moments is this woman comes crawling through the crowd and reaches up and touches the end of his, uh, of his, of his garment and is healed. And so we're, we, we did that last week, so we're going to skip that moment and jump back into the story after that. And so let's jump back to the story after that moment happened, after that woman is healed. 
<clears throat> and he allowed no one, okay? He allows no one, <clears throat> sorry, says, while he was still speaking. So he's speaking to the crowd. This woman has just been healed. He's speaking to them, okay? And he's talking to them. And some people from the house of the synagogue officials show up and they say this. They say, listen, your daughter has died. Why trouble the teacher anymore? Don't waste his time. She's gone. But Jesus, overhearing what was spoken, said to the synagogue official, he said to Jairus, he said this, do not be afraid any longer, only believe. I mean, sometimes we, 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 we want to make Christianity so complex. We want to make this relationship with God so complex. I don't know if we do it because then if we achieve anything, it makes us feel better because we've made it so difficult. So now, oh, but if I figure it out, then I really arrived because this was such a difficult thing. But my goodness, does Jesus make it so simple here? Do not be afraid any longer, only believe. The truth is, is that that right there is the answer to it all. We could stop right there and say we're done. But many of us won't be able to just respond that way to a situation we go through. Many of us can't just believe. But Jesus responds, do not be afraid any longer, only believe. And so he allowed no one to accompany him except Peter, James, and John. And they came to the house of the synagogue official. When they got there, he saw a commotion. And people were weeping and wailing. They were crying. And they were heartbroken that this girl was dead. And entering in, he said to them, why make such a commotion? Why are you weeping? Why is there such a commotion? Jesus says to them, listen, the child hasn't died, but is asleep. And they began laughing at him. Now, remember what Jesus said to Jairus. You know, why are you afraid? Only believe. So he shows up there and they're all crying and he's like, what are you crying for? She's not dead, she's only asleep. And they laugh at him and he puts them out. Why? Because they didn't believe. They didn't believe that, that what he said was true. They didn't believe that, that this, the life of this girl wasn't over yet. So he took the child's father and mother and his own companions and he entered the room where the child was. Taking the, taking the child by hand, he said to her, to leave the come, which translate and means Little girl, I say to you, get up. He takes her by the hand and he says, little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk. For she was 12 years old. And immediately they were completely astounded. Amen. Jesus responds to a difficult situation. He responds to a fearful. He responds to a heartbreaking. He responds to an anxiety-filled situation. And his response is, don't be afraid. Just believe. And so we're going to look at the lies when we talk about anxiety, when we talk about fear. We're going to look at the lies, and, and the lies say this, okay? Everything is out of control. Everything in my world is out of control. I am better off alone and separated. It feels so real, so it must be. I am scared and I can't feel God. These are just some of the lies that we tell ourselves when we're battling fear, when we're facing anxiety. These are just some of the lies that we tell ourselves when we're dealing with that, when we're, when we're up against that, when that's right in front of our face. And so and we're not going to spend time dwelling on the lies. We're going to do like we've been doing, and we're going to jump to the truth about these lies. We're going to jump to the truth about the lies that we deal with. And so John 14, 27 says this, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives, <clears throat> do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. Do not let your heart be troubled or let it be, be fearful. My peace I give to you. In the middle of the craziness, in the middle of all the situation you're dealing with, my peace, not your peace, not the peace the world gives, but my peace I give to you. Yes. Church would describe it as the peace that passes all understanding. Why? Because it won't make sense. Because it, it, it doesn't make sense. Because our minds can't completely grasp and understand our culture. The people around us, our family and friends and neighbors won't completely grasp and comprehend how you could be going through chaos, how you could be going through loss, how you could be going through hell in your life and yet still have peace. But there's something so powerful about God's peace and about the peace that Jesus gives to us. So we say these lines, everything is out of control, I'm better off alone, separated, <clears throat> you know, it feels like, uh, uh, so, you know, it, it's got to be real, because this is how it feels, so it, so it must be. I'm scared, uh, I can't feel God. And we talk about that everything is out of control, my whole world is out of control, and yet Revelation 117 says this, 
Revelation 1.17 says, When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. And he placed his right hand on me saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. You say, what does it have to do with the control? It's a reminder. Jesus said that he is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. And what does that mean? It means that everything in between is under his authority. That all of it is. There is nothing that happens outside of the knowledge and the understanding of God. There is no circumstance that you can go through that will catch God by surprise. It may catch you by surprise, but it's not going to catch him by surprise. There is nothing you will face. There was nothing that you will experience. There is no burden. There is no baggage. There is no chaos moment. There is nothing that will happen in your life. And God's going to go, oh, I wasn't ready for that. God's not up there in heaven. A quick angel comes running in. You know, Jesus, Jesus, listen. I don't know what's going on, but did you see Jimmy's life? Something crazy just happened and we didn't plan for it. And God's going to be like, oh my goodness, what do we do? And like, quick, push the emergency button. Something terrible has happened. Well, we got to pause it. Pause the system. We got to figure out. No, nothing surprises God. He's in control of all of it. He knows what's going to happen. He knows what's going on. He was prepared for your situations long before you were. Amen. The Bible says that Jesus was the lamb that was slain before the foundations of the earth. God already knew we were going to screw up. One of the things that makes him so incredible is the fact that he knew we were going to screw up and he still made us anyway. Talk about love. He knew we were going to mess up. He knew we were going to disappoint him. He knew that we were going to turn our backs on him. He knew that we were going to sin and be disobedient. He knew we were going to be selfish and prideful. And yet he still gave up his life for us. He still gave us a way out, even knowing that so many would reject him. So we talk about, and we continue on this, and everything's out of control. Luke 12, 22 to 26 is this. Do not worry about your life as to what you will eat, nor for your body as to what you, will, what you will put on. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap. They have no storeroom nor barn, and yet God feeds them. How much more valuable are you? How much more valuable you are than the birds? And which of you worrying can add a single hour to his lifespan? If then you cannot do even a very little thing, why do you worry about other, other matters? And the all idea in scripture and the all idea in this passage, listen, don't worry about the stuff going on in your life. God is going to take care of you. God is going to take care of what's going on. You are that crucial and that important to him. We come back to the lies. Everything is out of control. I'm better off alone and separated. My goodness, how often this happened. Uh, not too long ago, I, I posted a, 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 uh, an article uh, in a church page that talked about, you know, going to church and, and going there. And it talks about, listen, when you're in the toughest times in your life, that's when you need to show up. Yet what do we do? The moment things get difficult, we isolate ourselves. The moment things get tough, we disappear. The moment we're struggling in life, we close people off. We shut people down. But the truth is that the opposite should be happening. The opposite to happen in our lives is that we are not better off alone. We are not better off separated. Listen, you, by the very idea of Christianity, you can't be a Christian and go lock and hide yourself away. Why? Because one of the first commandments that Jesus gave to the disciples was to what? To go into the world and preach the gospel. It's really hard for me to go into the world and preach the gospel if I'm hiding in a cave alone from everybody because... And, you know, I'm just hurting or I'm struggling or I'm afraid or I'm scared or I'm anxious. Listen, we're called to share his word. We're called to represent him and who he is. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 and 10 says this. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. For if either of them falls, the one will lift up his companion. But woe to the one who falls when there's not another to lift him up. I will tell you this right now, this would be a lot easier for me to be standing up on here if I wasn't the only one holding these chains. It's a lot easier to move stuff. There's time we're around here, we're like, oh, we gotta move something. Hey, let's go get 15 people. Well, it only takes five. Yeah, but it's gonna be a lot lighter if there's 15 of us doing it than if there's five of us. Many hands make for light work. 
We were meant to work together. We were meant to be in this world together. We were meant to be communal and community. There's a reason why we call it Grace Community Church. Listen, when you're going through stuff, hiding is not the answer. Hiding is not the solution. It's difficult because when you're around people, they point things out. It's difficult when you're around people, they make you deal with stuff. It's difficult when you're around people, especially people that love and care, because they'll say, hey, what's wrong with you? What's going on? Are you all right? Don't lie to me. I know you're not okay. I know you're not doing okay. I can see it in your face. I know you're struggling. I know things are going on. Are you doing okay? And it makes us have to confront stuff. And it makes us have to challenge stuff. But the truth is, is that's the point. We're supposed to help one another. We're supposed to spur and push each other towards his greatness. Towards who he is. When we tell ourselves everything is out of control, I'm better off alone and separated. It feels so real, so it must be. Colossians 3, 2 says this, set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. So we've got to understand that when you're dealing with fear and anxiety, there's got to be a shift in your perspective. There's got to be a shift in our perspective that it's not about us and it's not about the junk that's going on, but shift our perspective to the things above, to the things of God and focus on him. Philippians 4, 8 says it beautiful. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. I will tell you this. This is a very, it's a, light, it's a nice verse in scripture. This is a nice verse in the Bible that, that gets quoted a bunch and gets thrown out there a bunch. And it is really nice. But it is so difficult to do. It is so challenging to do. <clears throat> this morning, I, 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 did, I did not sleep well, and, and, and you know, I'm not, I was not surprised by that or shocked by it, but I did not sleep well, and, 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 and you know, <clears throat> I, I don't, usually I don't really dream a whole lot that I remember or whatever, and it was just all throughout the night, just different dreams and different things, whatever, and at some point around 5, between 5 and 5.30, I, I woke up and was, you know, kind of awake for a while and, and, and right away thinking about all kinds of stuff and all kinds of things. And I just, I had to remind myself, I knew this was coming and I had to remind myself, no, 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 no. I got to think about God. I got to be focusing on you. And so what I decided to do was, you know what, instead of getting caught up in all the stress, all the anxiety, all things run through my mind, I'm going to start praying. And so I just started praying for whoever and whatever came to my mind. And so I started to pray. And then as I was praying, I didn't drift off to sleep. My mind started drifting off back to the anxiety, back to the stresses, back to the worries. Is this going to work? Are you going to be able to stand up for two services carrying this chain? Is anybody going to respond? You've been praying for freedom and praying for release and praying to see people in your church push and find freedom and break through from stuff. Is it actually going to happen? Is it actually, and I'm going through all that. No, no, no. Go back to praying. Start praying for, and, and get back to focus and get back to, and keep pushing myself to think about the things that this verse says. And not get caught up in the stress and get caught up in the anxiety, but to remember whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable. If there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. The fact is, is we can go right to this, the most basic level of all of this. I've said this, you know, over a month ago now. Is salvation not enough? The fact that Jesus Christ died for us should be enough for me to always have something to praise him, to always have something to thank him, to always have something to combat the fear, to combat the anxiety. As we talk about everything out of control, I'm better off alone and separated. It feels so real, so it must be. I am scared and I can't feel God. Psalm 56 and verse 3 to 4 says this, when I am afraid, I will put my trust in you. In God, whose word I praise, in God, I have put my trust. I shall not be afraid. What can mere man do to me? Amen. When I am afraid, I put my trust in him. When I am afraid, I put my trust in God. When fear creeps in. The solution, the answer is to not look to what you're afraid of, is to not dwell on what is terrifying. The look and the answer and the solution when dealing with fear is to put our trust in him, is to look to him, is to shift the focus to him. Deuteronomy 4, 29 says this. 
<clears throat> but from there you will seek the Lord your God and you will find him if you search for him with all your heart and with all your soul. I can't tell you the number of times I hear people say, and I felt this way at times in my life. Oh, I can't feel God. How do I know he's there? But I don't feel God. But I went to church and I saw people praising God, but I didn't feel it. And, 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 you know, I went to a Bible study. And people were talking and they were really getting into it. And I just didn't feel it. I was there at this service. It was supposed to be this great service. There was this revival thing going on. And people, I went and, and I just didn't feel it. Or I went to this conference and people were raising their hands and people were crying, whatever. And I just didn't feel it. Listen, don't live your life based on your feelings. Amen. Live your life based on truth. Because you know what? If I walked up to you and I slapped you, you would feel hurt across your face. And if you live the rest of your life holding on to that hurt, you'll never progress and go anywhere. We've got to learn that our feelings should not control us. Our feelings should not define us. They don't define our lives. And they sure as anything do not define who God is. I'm not called to live a life based on what I feel. I'm called to live a life on what is true. And the truth is that when I seek God, he shows up. The truth is, is that when I search for him, I find him. Yeah. <clears throat> James 4, 8. And those of you that followed along with our last, uh, our last challenge that we did and we read through James, you would have read this and I'm sure you would have found it as lovely as you find it today. And if you didn't read through and you didn't read James, you're going to love this one. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Right there. We'll just stop there and just leave it there because that sounds lovely and sweet. We'll just do that. I mean, right? Christians are allowed to do that. We can just pick what part of the Bible we want to use and then ignore the rest. <clears throat> pick the easy part. That's an easy part. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. All right, well, I showed up at church on Sunday. See, I drew near to God. God, why did you show up? How come I didn't feel you? Hey, we're doing a series on, on baggage and I've, I've paid attention sort of to most of it and, I, and I, I got the notes and looked down and read a couple verses and so, hey, my baggage shall be gone. Hey, listen, I went one step further. I even went forward and asked for prayer and went forward and, and spent some time crying, God. So now it's got to be gone. The baggage has got to be gone, right? Yeah, because James 4, 8 says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. So I've drawn near to you, God, so draw near to me. Fix it all. Take care of it all. Make sure everything is working right. Well, let's read the rest of the verse. See, it's up there. I didn't just put the beginning. I put the whole thing up there for you. So you can see the rest of it. <clears throat> Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. So wait, wait a minute. <laughs> what's, what's he saying? He says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. But understand something. <clears throat> As we draw near to him... We should be different. As we draw near to him, we can't live our lives in open rebellion of God and then expect God to move in our lives and be Lord of our lives when we want him. It doesn't work that way. You don't get to choose. Okay, Lord, now show up. I need you. Amen. Okay, Lord, where are you now? I don't feel you. I want to feel you. Where are you now? Listen, James said he puts it there. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. But part of that has to be our willingness and our openness to recognize that we sin and we screw up and we've got to put it out there. Right. We can't call God Lord and then live in open rebellion of him. It doesn't work. The battle to the, the, the way you battle rebellion is by submitting. The way you crush a rebellious spirit in your heart is by submitting. You don't defeat rebellion in your life. By, by, by playing a game with God and saying, well, God, I need you now. Well, no, I don't need you. I'm okay right now. Okay, God, well, well that was a kind of a good service. I should feel something. Are we going to do something magical? Like, are, are, are sparkles going to fall out of the sky and I'm going to have a little moment with you? No, you know how we defeat it? By coming under submission, by coming under God's authority, by coming under God's commands and being obedient to him and living a life that is holy and a life that is worth. It doesn't mean perfect, but it means living a life where I'm striving to be and reflect Jesus Christ. And if I am doing that, I am going to see God show up in my life. Amen. Fear and anxiety will have no control over me if God has control over me. I want to preach right there. You just mark that one down. Somebody take a note on that one and hold on to that one. So let's look at the application of all of this. We got to get to the application quick because this is getting heavy. <clears throat> Isaiah 43 once says this. But now thus says the Lord, your creator, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel. Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. 
<laughs> Put it in, in yellow on purpose. I don't know what's on the street behind me, but I got to turn and just look at it. Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, and you are mine. How powerful is that? That we don't have to fear that through the sacrifice of Jesus, we've been bought. He has purchased us. He has set us free. We've been redeemed, and he calls us by name. I am his. I mean, my goodness, how powerful is that to look and see that I am his, I am his child. And he wants what's best for me. And I'm his child, and he wants me to live a life that is free. He wants me to live a life that goes beyond this. He calls me, he calls me his. I am his. We talk about this whole application and we look at the whole application thing and we're going we're to go on and continue on looking at this and, 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 and looking at, at what this means and how we deal with this. Go ahead, we can go to the next slide. And so and we're looking at this. God promises some things. God promises some things. See, he promises that he will provide. It doesn't mean he's going to give you anything you want. It doesn't mean he's just, you know, like, oh, follow him now. And it's a get rich quick scheme, win the lottery kind of thing. No, but he promises he will provide. He promises in his word that he will protect. That he will take care of us, that he will protect. And you say, yeah, but then why did I get sick? Listen, it's part of it. Part of life is getting sick. Part of life is things going wrong. Jesus Christ said it in this world. You will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. Why? I have overcome the world. Amen. God promises he will provide, he will protect, and he will produce. God will produce in your life. You will see things happen in your life. You will see him move. You will see change. You will look at yourself and go, my goodness, I cannot believe I thought that way five years ago. My goodness, I can't believe I saw things that way five years ago. My goodness, I can't believe I talked that way five years ago. You will see God produce in your life when you are willing to trust him, when you're willing to, to answer to the truth and not live a life based on fear and based on anxiety, not live a life based on what you feel. <clears throat> the solution to my situations are not found in self, but in the Savior. The solution to situations are not found in self, but in the Savior. See, I have to get to the point where I understand that it's Him and that He's the one. He's the one that comes along, and I'm going to put the microphone down for a second because this is, this is coming off. I'm done. I'm good. <laughs> Whew. I might be able to touch the ceiling now. <laughs> My goodness. <clears throat> we have to understand that the solution to what we're dealing with is not in ourselves, it's in Him. He is the answer. He is the solution. He is the one that's going to get us through and, and get us through all of this. And, and I do, and I understand that there are people that, that deal with anxiety and, 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 and there are people that are on, on medication that deal with anxiety. And I'm not saying that, 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 that God doesn't use those things to help. But I'm not saying that at all, so don't take it wrong, all right? I went to school for psychology. I spent time as a social worker. I've been around that world. You know, uh, Jed was a, a therapist, you know, uh, be, before he moved here. We, I understand that, I get that, but we've got to recognize and realize that my first, my, the first place I turn, the first uh, solution to my problems needs to be Jesus Christ, not pills, not, not you know, anything else but him. We have moved away from that. We don't recognize that. I get the headache, and what's the first thing you do? You run to the cabinet to pop the Tylenol. Listen, I'm not saying the Tylenol is bad, and I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm not saying don't take it. But on the way to the bathroom, start praying. Yeah. On the way to the bathroom, seek him first. Be dependent on him completely for everything and every aspect of your life and watch what God is going to do. But some of us don't believe that we can be set free from anxiety and fear. Some of us don't believe that we can see release from those things. 
I'm here to tell you that everything in scripture points to your freedom. I'm here to tell you that everything in scripture, the story, that love story, the story of the Bible from Genesis all the way to Revelation, you know what it points to? Our freedom, our salvation. There isn't a person in this room that Jesus Christ didn't willingly give up his life for. There isn't a person in this room that freedom isn't right there for you. You have got to push towards it. You've got to do some of the work. It, 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 it's, it's right there. I mean, it's as simple as, as, you know, someone walks up to you and says, hey, you want $100? And they hold their hand out with a $100 bill in it. What would you do? You'd reach out and take it. I mean, no one here would question that. If I right now pull that, I'm not going to, all right? So don't get out of your seats and think it's happening, okay? If I right now pulled out, forget a hundred, let's go one step further. I pulled out a thousand dollar bill and said it's free. Y'all, y'all would stop being community, okay? Y'all would forget about our mission. You would forget about our prayer. You would forget about Jesus, right? You would be like, Jesus, stay in the seat. I need this money. And y'all would be fighting, Okay, this is why we're recording this, because if it happened, I would want proof of the assault that took place, okay, at church. If I held my hand out with a thousand dollar bill and said, this bill is free, some of you would be climbing over each other, scrambling to get this. Okay? And yet Jesus Christ stands before you and he says, here, it's free. And our response is... Well, we'll see. Maybe. Uh, well, really, well, uh, well, I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'll take it. Listen, it's there for you. Reach out and grab it. It's there for you. Connect with it. It's there for you. Take it. God does not desire, does not want you to see, to see you living a life with baggage. To see you live a life that's carrying anxiety and carrying fear. He wants to see you trust him. He wants to see you love him. He wants to see you free. Last week we ended with this and I had to put it out there again because we just needed to. It says we cannot expect God to do a new thing in our lives when we continue to live the old way. We got to do more. We got to do different. Everything that you have done, and I'm not saying it's bad, so don't take it wrong. That's a good shit. My whole life was wrong until today. That's not what I'm saying. Everything that you have done has gotten you to this point. Praise God for it. The good, the bad, the really, really, really bad, <laughs> the really, really, really good. Everything that you've experienced, everything that has happened in your life, all of that has gotten you to this point. But if you want to get beyond this point, you can't keep living in what has happened and what has been done and what you've done in the past. You've got to move beyond that. So it may require some extra sacrifice. It may require some extra spending time in his word. It may require you showing up to church a little extra. It may require you serving more. It may require you changing what you do and how you do it to focus even more on God. You're like, yeah, but I give God so much. Good. Give him some more. You want to see more of him in your life? Give him more. Because it's an amazing thing. Because the more you give him, the more room you have for him. The more I give him out of my life, the more room I have to see his life in mine. And so my prayer continues to be <clears throat> that we would, we would see freedom from all of this stuff. And my prayer continues to be as we, as we focus on and we wrap up next week this whole idea of baggage. My prayer continues to be for this church, for you guys as individuals. Set us free, Lord. Help us be free. Help us to seek your freedom. And we're going to end with a song that, that, that's going to play, and, and, and it, it's, it's fitting. We had, we, 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 you know, got into worship with Train Breaker, and it's fitting that we end tonight <clears throat> focusing on, on God breaking every chain. And honestly, I wasn't going to, we were going to play the song and just have a time of reflection. I wasn't going to end, end it this way, but I, I, I think we, we need to. Because I know there are people in this room that you're dealing with anxiety and fear and you struggle with it. And I'm going to challenge you 
to come forward and seek his face. And I'm going to challenge you to come up here and seek his faith and find freedom from this anxiety and fear. Come forward and have people pray with you. We'll get people up here, pray with you. Listen, we'll go old school, break, break out the oil and, 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 you know, and bathe them in the stuff. <clears throat> but we're gonna see some freedom today and we're gonna see some release today. And if you don't want it, and if you're not willing to pursue it, I don't care. The lights will go off, the lights will go dim, we'll stop recording this, and I'll pursue it, and I'll, and I'll go for it, because I don't want to carry that anymore. I don't want my life to be defined by this anymore. I don't want to be bound and be chained down by fear and anxiety and stress and all of that that comes with it. I want the mind of Christ. I want my mind to be free. I want my mind to see and to understand the glories of the kingdom of God. Not stuck on all of this nonsense and all of this garbage that I keep feeding myself with. I keep getting battered with in my life. And so if you want to see freedom, if you want to see release then I'm going to challenge you to come forward and to find him. And if you can't get to this altar, put your hand up and, and, or stand where you're at. And, and listen, if you see somebody standing, don't leave them there alone. Go and pray with them. You see somebody up here at this altar, you come up and you pray with them. <clears throat> but today is a great day to experience freedom. Today is a great day. I didn't get up at 5.30 in the morning because that was not my choice. <clears throat> to be praying. For all kinds of things. And be praying for today. And be praying for you. And be praying for freedom. To not give it a chance. And to not prepare the opportunity for it to happen. So guess what? As soon as I'm done. Alright. The lights are going to go off. The music's going to play. And you come on up here. And you fight. And you push through yourself. And you fight through the lies. To experience the freedom that comes in Jesus Christ. And that's my prayer, and that's what I, I believe, and that's what I'm looking for in my life. I'll ask you, you're willing to join me, then join me. Go ahead.